Rick. He's one of our great actors, writers, directors, theater impresarios, a great pal of mine, a great pal of ours, Rick. Tell the folks what you're going to do. All right. Well, uh, in past years, Moses has uh, had the privilege of being invited to this festival to do excerpts from a play called Bigger Than Jesus and another called Hard Sell. But today, and now you can cue video A, I'm going to talk to you about another project that I'm developing, and it's called... Boom. Now, Boom is an explosive solo performance that tries to capture the defining moments of the baby boom generation. Now, I'm immersed in multimedia, and I will guide the audience through 25 years of turbulent history and give voice to over 100 of the world's most influential politicians, activists, musicians. And it is, trust me, a mind-blowing experience, mostly for me, immersed in that capsule, but also for nostalgic all boomers. audiences of all generations. And uh, our children, too. Them, too. Now. Uh, boom it covers the years 45 to 69, not technically the boom, but it starts with the boom of Hiroshima that ended World War II, and it ends with the boom of Apollo 11 that launched Neil Armstrong and company up to the moon. Now these two iconic moments, they span this incredibly influential period, which was fueled primarily by an incredibly influential generation that were important not only for their numbers, but also for advances in uh, technology, in communication, and of course in culture. Now, Boom is a collage of stories of that time told from today's perspective. Stories of the famous, an iron curtain has descended across the European continent. Descamisados, la clase obrero milemos triunfado. I suppose if I had said that television was more popular than Jesus, I might have got away with it. Yeah. To the not-so-famous, Rudy was born in war-torn Vienna, Lawrence was born in the projects of Chicago, and Maddie was born in suburban Canada, middle-class Canada. As global events unfold around these people, uh, there is Cold War, McCarthyism, Beatlemania, JFK, MLK, Mao, Vietnam, the Summer of Love brings all these stories together, and boom ends as it began with a new generation born into a new world order. So it was created with this, uh, what I call a crack team of Canadian designers over two years at Robert Lepage's Ex Machina La Caserne in Quebec City. And it will premiere officially in January 2014 in Calgary. Now, entertainment is only one part of the vision. We also have, uh, we want to educate, we want to enlighten, and we want to empower young people through our transmedia outreach initiatives, which relates to the technology aspect of this festival. This is not just a history lesson. This is a, what I think of as a living, breathing time capsule that shakes up the past folds it into the future. Why? Because I think how we remember and what we remember not only tells us about where we come from, but about who we are now and where we're going. So if you have any questions, you can visit the website, you can email me, you can talk to me after. We'll let little Richard finish. So, now, I'm going to do a little excerpt from this show. Um, boomers, now you, call, you can call them Zoomers, you can call them whatever you like, or the pig in the python, have you heard of that expression? Now, basically, boomers uh, remodeled society as they passed through it. They had a huge influence on the, the baby food that was created to feed them, to the suburbs that were built to house them, to the yeah, schools that were sprung up to educate them, to the healthcare system that is perhaps bracing to nurse them into old age. Now, some of you here are probably boomers, right? Raise your hands. Or zoomers, does that raise the net? Does it cast it wider? All right, so you know, some of you probably have free time, discretionary income, you like to support the arts, at least you say you do. Now, why is that? I think it's because when you were coming of age that culture, culture had impact, real lasting impact. And I'd even say for a few years in the 60s, culture and politics fused together like, like a DNA molecule. They were one thing and that hasn't happened before. It probably won't ever happen again in that same way. It caused this huge explosion of creativity and consequence that still reverberates to this day for people like me who are not necessarily boomers. I was born right on the edge. Now, um, I'm not a boomer, I'm not a historian, I am a storyteller and a performer. What you're about to see are little excerpts of uh, low-tech excerpts, I might add, of Boom, which is a big tech show. It's 90 minutes, 25 years. What I'll do for you today is a little bit off the top, a little bit in the middle, and a little bit at the end, just to give you that little, that little flavor, little soupçon of Boom. So we're going to do um, three years in, say, 
well, about 12 and a half minutes, starting now. <clears throat> Play video B. <clears throat> we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing, but let us not forget for a moment the toil and efforts that lie ahead. I'm waiting for my video. I will pause as Winston Churchill. <laughs> Japan, with all her treachery and greed, remains unsubdued. The injury she has inflicted upon Great Britain, the United States, and other nations calls for justice and retribution. Long live the cause of freedom, and God save the king. My fellow Americans, the world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war and to save the lives of thousands of Americans. We shall continue to use it until we completely destroy Japan's capacity to make war. Till the end of time Long as stars are in the blue Long as there's a spring of birds to sing, I'll go on loving you. Dad came home from Europe, and he hadn't seen Mom and Chris in over four years. And apparently he was the only soldier at the train station whose family didn't come to greet him. So he, he goes to pick up a payphone. He calls Mom and says, honey, I'm home. She hangs up on him. She thinks it's a, you know, someone playing a nasty joke. So he, he packs up his bags, walks all the way home, comes to the door, says, honey, I'm home. And nine months later, boom, there's me. <laughs> and there is Maddie. And Maddie, like so many boomers, was born of the newfound optimism and economic prosperity that came to most victorious countries at the end of World War II. So couples who couldn't afford families during the Great Depression, like Maddie's parents, well, they start making up for lost time, getting married, buying houses, and having babies. Lots and lots of babies. These babies are born into a new world order where crooners belt, factories build, and consumers buy. Now, that's the common story anyway. And then there's Lawrence. On the day I was born, 80,000 people died in Hiroshima. Three days later, Nagasaki, another 70,000 lives. Welcome to the world, little man. <laughs> Your dad was in, a, was in another theater of war, like how they say theater, right? Well, in that theater, he got shot in the leg, came back early in 43. Uh, he gets a cocktail waitress pregnant. His mama forces him to marry the poor girl, father the poor child. Now, is that, is that a comedy or a tragedy? <laughs> Yafati was an actor and a singer, and when the German troops came into Vienna, uh, at the Einmarsch, right, he, he didn't have to uh, pledge allegiance to Hitler because he has bad eyes like me, so he kept on doing uh, operettas uh, throughout the war, singing and dancing and such. Yeah, Panem et Circenses, he would tell me. Bread und Circus is Rudi. You keep the people distracted and always gives them a happy ending, yeah? Oh, oh. Christmas, Mr. Potter! And Happy New Year to you, too. In jail, going home, they're waiting for you. <laughs> Mary! Mary! Ma Ma oh, oh, Ma oh. Mary! Oh, well, hello, Mr. Bank Examiner. How are you? Mr. Bailey, there, there's a deficit. I know, $80,000. George, I have a paper here. I'll bet it's a warrant for my arrest. I'm going to jail. How about that? Merry Christmas. Where's Mary? Slipping and sliding, peeping and hiding, been told a long time ago. Slipping and sliding, peeping and hiding, been told a long time ago. I've been told, baby, you've been bold. I don't want to be your fool no more. Now, while on tour in Iowa, when his pregnant wife was at home, Buddy Holly hired a chartered plane with his fellow bandmates and headliners, Richie Valens and JP, the big bopper Richardson. Now, Waylon Jennings, who was supposed to be on the plane, gives up his seat. And Holly shouts out to him, Well, I bet your old bus freezes up. Jennings shoots back, I hope your old plane crashes. 
As you know, the plane crashed in a cornfield, killing the pilot and all three passengers. Now they say, and Don McLean famously said, that was the day the music died. But soon enough, a new decade is born, one in which music would galvanize a generational conflict unlike any seen before or since. But the 60s, they're so often misunderstood, they're so often mythologized, they actually begin with a renewed sense of hope. This romantic idealism fueled by this generation of teenagers who were taught to believe that they were special and that they could change the world around them and themselves for the better. Now, I came to Montreal at the start of La Révolution Tranquille, right? The Quiet Revolution. Uh, it was Sauvé who died, and then uh, Le Sage gets to power with the slogan, C'est le temps que ça change, right? Time for change. Agreed. I was 23. It felt like the right place to be. I got an apartment in the Plateau on Esplanade. I worked for the amateur theater company, Deutsches Theater. I then, uh, well, I got a job with an advertising agency, and I started looking for girls, yeah? I guess I was a typical 14-year-old teenager of the time, listening to my transistor radio under the sheet. <laughs> Chris gave this to me when he, yeah, when he left. And, you know, I, I guess uh, my bedroom was covered with posters of Roger Smith, Troy Donahue, and yes, Bobby Hull. <laughs> now that Chris was gone, I was the one watching Hockey Night in Canada with Dad. And after school, I had graduated from Howdy Doody to American Bandstand, dancing by myself in the living room. Ladies and gentlemen, Chubby Checker. Come on, baby. Let's do the twist. Come on, baby. Let's do the twist. Take me by the little hand. And it goes like this. It goes like this. All right. February 1st, four black boys walk into a Woolworths lunch counter, and they ask to be served coffee and donuts. Well, the waitress says, I'm sorry, we don't serve you here. So, uh, well, them boys just sit there quietly, jeered and insulted by the whites. Next day, 60 people outside. Next day, 300. Demonstrations start happening all over the country, including the one I went to in Chicago. The wind of change is blowing all over the world. The old is giving way to the new in politics and in culture. And when the two merge together in a medium like television, well, the wind of change blows even faster. Presidential candidates Kennedy and Nixon face off in the first ever televised presidential debate. Whereas radio listeners feel Nixon has won the debate, Kennedy, of course, is the clear winner on television. I appeared rested, tanned, and confident. Whereas I looked up pale, sickly, and tired. Yes, that is true. I <laughs> also refused to wear makeup. And as a result, your stubble and sweat show prominently on 80 million TV screens across the nation. Yes, that's true, too. <laughs> Kennedy's inauguration was a lot like Obama's, full of hope that would soon dissolve. You see, it's all about the details, right? Look, here's Eisenhower, all bundled up, old man with a scarf, and this new guy. No scarf, no overcoat, big ideas, a big smile. People were buying it all over the world. Here's me wondering why everybody's such a sucker for a white man on TV. Introducing Ken, Barbie's boyfriend. Now, if you buy Ken, they can go to fraternity parties, have lunch together, or just relax. If you buy Barbie and Ken, let's see where their romance will lead. And you can tell it's Mattel, it's swell. What would you do if I say out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out of me? Let me your ears and I'll sing you a song. I would try not to sing out of key. Oh, baby. Oh, would I help from my friends? All right, let me tell you. The revolution didn't happen. Okay, the system is still the system, right? History doesn't change. It's not a straight line, right? It's a circle going round and round and round. We become our parents, whether we like it or not. All right, look what happened to the hippies, right? I'm skipping ahead. That was right. I was skipping ahead. I was going to talk about Apollo. This is, this is a picture of uh, basically the earth rising that Apollo took. And now the boomers were becoming adults themselves. They elect a prime minister in the voting booth who reflects this line between old and new, between counterculture sex symbol and father figure. I think my policies are a sign of the times. As I legalize homosexuality, I champion divorce laws, I champion bilingualism, and I speak of a just society. 
I'm friends with the likes of Marshall McLuhan, of uh, Fidel Castro, of John Lennon, and frankly, I'm the closest Canada will ever come to a rock star politician. Feelings getting stronger. Music getting longer too. supposed to talk and say the revolution didn't happen, right? The system is still the system. Pardon me if you've heard this before, right? See, we become our parents. History is not a straight line. It's a circle going round and round. We become our parents, as simple as that. Look, look what happened to all the hippies, right? What, well, what did they turn into? They turned into yuppies, right, when they started to smell money. And all of a sudden, hey, greed is good, and greed is God, and that job, and that house, and that car, and the picket fence that mom and dad had, they all start looking pretty good, right? And then, hey, their children start marching in the streets, recycling the old slogans, talking about, you know, revolution and all that. Look, I'm not angry. I'm just saying, right? At graduation, I graduated with honors, by the way. There were two surprises waiting for me. One was dad, after all these years of shaking his head at me and my goddamn college degree, there he is standing with a bouquet of red roses. I swear, I almost peed myself. I was so happy. And then surprise number two, off in the distance, like in some romantic comedy or a really cheesy ad. You see, I didn't have a bouquet of red roses like, uh, like her father, but I did have one long-stemmed rose sticking between my teeth, a nice Trudeau-like touch, yeah? And of course, uh, the tickets to the Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals sticking out of my coat pocket because it's all about the details. The bastard won me over. He comes to introduce himself to my dad, and my dad seems to approve, despite the German accent. Rudy asks what my dad does for a living. My dad says, I make cars. Dad, he asks the same of Rudy. Rudy says, I make people want cars. <laughs> and then it all starts spinning so quickly. The train to Montreal a hockey game, my first job interview, my first job, my first apartment, my first marriage proposal, on my first cruise, I made love, I got pregnant again. On the day I was conceived, Apollo 11 lifted off from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, taking the humans to be the first to walk on the moon. This is ground control to Major Tom. You've really made the grade. And the papers want to know shirts you wear. Wrong verse, that's all right. Now it's time to leave the capsule if you dare. Thank you very much.